All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I want to give credit where credit is due. Um, everything I'm about to tell you about in the next 15 minutes was actually uh, designed by Mike Drotboom and uh, Perry Greenfield, my uh, co-authors on here, and uh, Mike did all the actual implementation uh, in code on it. Uh, so I'm just the messenger this afternoon and also one of the primary users of the system. Um, so when we get to the question time, we'll just direct everything uh, to Perry. So for the past 25 years, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope has been in orbit. Um, we don't worry too much about the pesky atmosphere from there. Uh, it's been doing a great job at uh, doing all kinds of great astronomy over that uh, span of 25 years. And uh, in about three years, NASA hopes to launch uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, which will be a, a larger uh, infrared optimized uh, telescope that will be a successor to Hubble. Um, that's not the real telescope. Uh, we tend not to put the flight hardware out in the middle of a field. Uh, <laughs> and the, the data from uh, both of these observatories is uh, processed and managed by uh, all the friendly folks at the Space Telescope Science Institute located in Baltimore, uh, some of whom are in this room. Uh, most of them are friendly. So when we think of things like uh, images from the Hubble Space Telescope, people tend to think of things that look like this, um, pretty amazing looking scenes of uh, well, this one in particular is a nearby uh, group of galaxies known as Stefan's Quintet. But what most people, uh, unless you're in astronomy, uh, don't realize is that uh, this is the end product of a fairly lengthy process of uh, getting data uh, out of the system. And when uh, data first hits the ground coming uh, directly from the telescope, uh, it tends to look more like this. So this is actually one of the exposures uh, that went into making up this really beautiful image. Uh, but this is, in fact, uh, what they look like when they first hit the ground. Uh, uh, just a direct readout of the detector in the camera. And, you know, you can see a few astronomical uh, type objects in there, but there's also a whole lot of other stuff um, that isn't astronomical at all. Um, they are due to imperfections in the detector manufacturing process. Uh, they're due to uh, signals introduced in the electronic uh, uh, chain that reads out the detector itself. Um, they are due to uh, high energy particles slamming their way through the detector substrate during the exposure, leaving a trail of light behind. This is what we call cosmic ray hits. So things look relatively messy at first. Fortunately, most if not all of these effects are pretty stable and we can easily, well not always easily, but we can reliably uh, clean them up with some amount of work. And so once you apply um, some appropriate processing to remove all these artifacts, you start to get to something that looks like this. Um, here in this image, that's the same image where all of the detector level and instrument level artifacts have been removed. Um, still have a few uh, things that are due to like the cosmic ray hits and stuff. But you know, now it's starting to look like a real image that you're used to seeing. And instead of just the two bright galaxies up in the corner that you could see in the raw image, you can now see that the whole field is full of all kinds of faint uh, sources down there. And so one more step of cleaning things up, like removing the cosmic ray hits, um, you've now got uh, a perfectly calibrated and cleaned image. Uh, there are still gaps here and there where there were uh, dead pixels on the detector that haven't been cleaned up. So then by combining multiple exposures of the same field, you can fill in uh, you know, the gaps of the dead pixels and also in larger field of view so that and by combining about a dozen or so exposures, you can get a nice image that looks like this. Um, and then by doing the same process through different filters that uh, captures light at different wavelengths, you can combine those uh, 
grayscale images into um, color images uh, that you're used to seeing like this on the front page of the newspapers. And so, and by the way, that's about the only place you'll ever see images like this and it's on the front page of the newspapers. Um, astronomers themselves don't use color images like this to do their analysis. They strictly work on the individual uh, grayscale images one at a time. So that process doesn't happen by itself. Um, this is where software comes in, very handy. And it's a software process that in astronomy we refer to as a calibration pipeline. Um, spend just a minute defining what we need, mean by a calibration pipeline. Um, this pipeline is just all the series of steps uh, that you saw were used to correct uh, the data when they first come down from the telescope. Now the images actually go through um, an even larger end-to-end uh, -end, uh, set of processing, uh, starting with everything from reformatting the raw telemetry that came from down from the telescope, populating uh, various sorts of uh, metadata that's associated with each exposure. All that metadata comes from different databases and other sources like that. Then we have the process of actually calibrating uh, the image pixel values themselves. Then they go, go through the process of being archived and distributed to users and so on. So that whole end-to-end -end system is also managed by a very high-level pipeline process that does all the usual kinds of things of task scheduling and process management and all those sorts of things. Whereas the calibration pipelines that I'm going to talk to you today about are just that middle portion where you're just processing uh, the pixel values of each image uh, itself in order to make it science analysis ready uh, for the astronomers. So over the 25 years that Hubble has been in orbit, there has been a total of 11 different scientific instruments that were put on it at different times. And so the calibration pipelines uh, for those instruments were written over a very long uh, span of time. We have 11 different pipelines, one uh, for each instrument. Uh, they're written in a variety of languages, of course, because they were spread out over such a great length of time. Some of them started out in a language that almost no one in this room has probably heard of called SPP. It's a language that was specifically written uh, to do uh, astronomical image processing back in the 1980s. We had a few that were written in Fortran. We finally dragged ourselves into the uh, 20th century by moving to C about a decade or so ago. <laughs> and um, most recently, uh, we finally made the move over uh, to Python. So, as you can imagine, having 11 different pipelines written in like, you know, four different languages makes maintenance a bit of a nightmare, especially as, you know, people come and go. Uh, the new people coming in have no idea what they're looking at when they look at one of the old pipelines that were written in SPP or Fortran or something like that. And there's almost no possibility of sharing code between uh, the different pipelines. And they were also written in a very monolithic way, just a huge end-to-end -end procedure where data came in one end, they went through 10 or 20 steps, and the data was written out at the other end. And so it was just one gigantic executable that was run, and which is okay when you're running in an automated production environment for processing the data, but a lot of times astronomers need to tweak uh, the calibration for their own observations to get the most science out of it. And so it's nearly impossible to do that uh, with this type of design uh, for your pipeline. So for JWST, we're trying to take advantage of slightly more modern uh, programming techniques when writing the calibration pipelines for it. Um, they're all being written in Python, a few C extensions here and there where we need the, uh, the speed up for you know, heavy number crunching types of operations. Um, each individual processing step is written as a Python class uh, those individual step classes can be strung together into uh, a pipeline or one or more pipelines. Pipelines themselves are just an instance of something that also looks like a class and so you can string multiple pipelines together if you want into an even higher level uh, unit. 
So it's much more flexible uh, than the old systems. And it's all managed by this uh, Python module uh, that we call STPipe, Space Telescope Pipeline. Uh, clever naming. Uh, and so a lot of the um, common functions that need to take place in each individual step or pipeline are handled by this STPipe environment. And it allows the pipelines to be run not only from command line, which is fine for production environment, but you can also run them interactively from within Python. And yeah, I obviously don't have enough time today to go into all the gory details, so uh, there are more gory details in the uh, paper in the proceedings if you want to take a look at that. So let's see here. I need to keep moving quickly. So the ST pipe environment itself, as I said, provides a lot of common functionality uh, for all the steps. Handles a lot of the mundane things like parsing uh, configuration settings, uh, you know, individual parameter settings that apply to some of the individual steps. It handles all the uh, file management and data I.O. Uh, between the steps and, and into and out of the pipelines. And uh, of course, uh, things like logging and so on. Uh, and so this relieves uh, the developers of the actual, you know, correction steps from having to do all of this kind of stuff in each of the steps. So they can concentrate on just the algorithm needed to fix the data and don't have to worry about all the things involved with I.O. and argument parsing and all that sort of thing. So just give you a very uh, simple example of what a step could look like. Uh, very, very simple in order to get it to simply fit on one slide. Um, Here's what a, a step could look like. The flat field step here is defined as a Python class that inherits from the, uh, uh, the generic step class defined by stpipe. Uh, it defines uh, a particular type of uh, reference data file that it needs to do its work. And so then the actual process method of the step itself uh, simply involves opening uh, the input that it's been given and it opens it into a software data model. I'll say more about the data models in just a minute. Does a simple retrieval of uh, the reference file uh, data that it needs to perform this step, and then goes off and sends the input data and uh, the reference data into the, uh, the actual correction uh, method that actually modifies the pixel values for this step. And the result is then returned back up uh, to the ST pipe environment, which then either passes that result on to the next step if you're running a pipeline, or if the step is run by itself, it takes care of saving uh, the result to disk when it's, the process is done. So as I mentioned earlier, you can execute steps or pipelines either from the command line or from within Python itself. From the command line, you use this ST run uh, command that is part of ST pipe. Uh, the arguments to it are simply either the class name of the step or pipeline that you want to run, as well as the, uh, the input uh, file that contains your data that it needs to work on. <coughs> or from within Python, uh, you just import uh, the step class or pipeline class that you want to run and uh, just use the call method on that uh, class and again, giving it the name of your input and uh, optionally a uh, configuration file that specifies uh, particular uh, argument values uh, to use during the step execution. So an example of a very simple pipeline, again, very simple, just so it'll fit on one slide. <laughs> um, just import uh, the three different uh, pipeline step classes that you want to use. Uh, this step defs, uh, uh, listing that you see there is basically just a dictionary uh, giving, uh, mapping the step class names to variable names within uh, the pipeline. And then in the actual process method for the pipeline, you see the input data simply being passed from one step to the next. In this case, the, uh, the results of each step are just overwriting the input as it's passed from one to the next. And again, uh, at the very end, 
uh, the results are just passed back up to the ST pipe environment. Okay, so I mentioned data models a minute ago. Uh, tell you a bit about those. Um, the ST pipe environment, I believe, as I mentioned earlier, handles all the data I/O that's necessary uh, to get the data off of disk and uh, into memory, so that it can be uh, operated on. Again, this relieves the uh, people who are writing the actual step code from having to do this, and. The software data models, uh, we have them defined for all the different types of data products that uh, come from the telescope, as well as a lot of our uh, calibration reference data. Um, and so not only does this make it convenient for the uh, writers of each step that they don't have to do the I.O., but it also puts a buffer uh, between the code and the actual on-disk file format. Um, right now, most astronomers use the uh, FITS file format, stands for uh, Flexible Image Transport System. Uh, there are uh, processes underway to come up with new data file formats. Go hear Perry's talk in a, about an hour on that. Uh, and so if the file format changes, we don't want to have to change all the calibration pipeline code to match, and so the use of the data models kind of insulates the code from that, that all the specifics of uh, the file format and structure are handled in the, uh, the process of loading and storing the data models. Uh, the models themselves are um, just defined as containing you know, a bundle of array or tabular data along with all sorts of metadata. Um, since I'm about out of time here, I'm just going to skip right to uh, this example that again just shows what a simple data model, uh, uh, the definition looks like. We define it using JSON schema. Uh, here we've just got a couple of two-dimensional data arrays uh, where the uh, data type is declared along with the dimensionality and uh, various pieces of information like that. And then a user um, can use these models if you're inside Python, and just load our models library. You can do a call to models.open, uh, give it an argument that is your file name that you want to read the data from, and it returns a uh, data model to you, which then enables you to access various elements of the metadata uh, structure uh, that's right out of uh, keywords in the data file. And then all the data arrays that are part of the model uh, are just implemented as uh, normal NumPy uh, ND arrays, and so you can do all the usual types of uh, NumPy operations on them. So at this point, I'll just put up the summary slide and leave it there for you to read while I uh, hopefully entertain questions. Thank you. What were there any questions that Matt could come up and uh, get, get started setting up? Uh, we have time for a few questions. So Make them loud and clear because I'm starting to lose my hearing. <laughs> It seems that over the years, unfortunately, that you know each observatory, each uh, big project like this, has tended to build things that were pretty well customized for their own needs, and hence none of them were terribly portable or yeah usable by other projects. Um, we may have ended up doing somewhat similar thing here, but we've tried to keep things generic enough that it could conceivably be used by others. Um, but yeah, they're just, a survey of the field just didn't reveal much that uh, we could have adopted easily, so unfortunately. Unfortunately, that's one of the tendencies in astronomers. Astronomers tend to have an attitude that if it wasn't built here, it's not right. <laughs> so, yeah. So in that same vein, have you contacted other observatories or other uh, projects to see, you know, where there might be commonalities between their code, like how this is being built? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, we certainly plan to do that. I mean, this is all still very much uh, a work uh, in process yet. Um, but yeah, uh, well, I don't know if Perry wants to join in on this too. He's had a little more contact with some of the other organizations as well. But um, we very much plan to not only make uh, the whole environment and the code you know, available to all astronomers who are using JWST data itself, but given that the whole thing is distributable to just our community should make it very easy for anyone else who wants to adapt it to their own needs as well. <laughs>